I'm Nikki Almacy, a photojournalist working in Asia for over 15 years. During this time I've had the opportunity to shoot the most exciting projects from architecture through culture to art and heritage. Through Photojournalist Diaries I would like to invite you along this journey, so if you feel like it please hit the subscribe button. Once I was in this Jackie Chan movie called Forbidden Kingdom in 2008, working as an extra of course, and even in that movie I'm standing there on the screen reading a Q magazine. Once the 90s were over, I came out some sort of a fog, this eight years spent in London, and all of a sudden I found myself with this enormous pile of British music papers and magazines, and I'm talking hundreds of them. For the love of God, I couldn't figure out why I was collecting them and why I was so obsessed with them in the first place, until years later when I picked up my first camera, and that's when the penny dropped that all I've been doing all through those years was basically absorbing visual information and inspiration. So later on when I started to take photos, I, I kind of instantly knew what was working and what was, what was iconic. So the mystery was solved. This is how I kind of realized what I've been doing all through those years was unknowingly preparing myself for editorial photography. <music> All my life revolved around magazines. I mean, everything I ever done or achieved or anything interesting that happened to me was one way or another through or connected to magazines. I got my friends out of magazines. Hell, I even got my wife out of magazines. In the very, very early 90s, I was totally lost in Hungary. I mean, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know who I wanted to be or where I was going. The only thing I cared about was pop and rock music and that, that was actually leading my life. And uh, in my hometown I discovered this uh, music library and I discovered that the music library had all the enemies, the New Musical Express, this British music weekly paper going back to the 1950s documenting all these bands and singers like Elvis Presley, uh, The Beatles, David Bowie, Deep Purple, um, Mark Boland, T-Rex, going up through the 80s and to the 90s, to the very early 90s. And what I did was I started to frequent this music library. Uh, every day I went in there like early morning and was going through all these enemies, going back to really to the 50s. Although my English wasn't that good, I started to read the articles, I started to study them and translate them. This is all what mattered to me, this music library and the New Musical Express and, the, and this, this distant British world that I got out of it. So every morning I went there and I started to go through all the issues of the enemy and emerged around 6 p.m. completely covered with, with ink because enemy had this bad quality ink. Actually, I, I didn't know back then, but it was like an open joke about this paper that uh, you could actually recognize whoever was reading enemy because they were covered in uh, their fingers and their face was covered in in ink. Actually on, uh, on YouTube there's a, a New Musical Express, an NME documentary and it's called Inky Fingers because this, uh, it had this very bad ink. What I did was I was started to translate this magazine for myself and collected all the clippings and meanwhile I was uh, 
I was translating other books too and, and my world kind of closed in, but in a good way because it created uh, like a parallel universe in my hometown that uh, later became my reality in London. So after I eventually moved to London, it kind of became like a ritualistic habit of mine that every Tuesday around 4 p.m. when the enemy and the Melody Maker came out, I went up to Piccadilly Circus, I just went into Burger King with my copies, sat down, ordered a coffee, and I read both of them from the front page to the last. It was always the highlight, one of the most important things that I did that week. It was just so liberating that now I didn't have to go to the music library to get it and make photocopies, but I could just go to Piccadilly Circus and get my own copy and it was just just brilliant. I have only one copy left of the hundreds and hundreds. Anyway, Enemy was the ultimate tastemaker, the weekly bible for all the fans, the musicians, and even for the stars themselves, really. Tuesdays were like the judgment day for all the musicians because this is when all the album reviews and the live reviews came out. Enemy had the power of making and destroying bands. They had a very strong opinion about everything and it was it was highly influential with great writing and brilliant brilliant photography it's a single-handedly the most important british music publication for about 60 years i keep highlighting enemy because obviously it was so important for me but then again this was the golden age of music magazines in britain i mean they had the q select uh, I think Mojo came later, but there was Record Collector and countless of other brilliant, brilliant magazines and I collected all of them. Reading Enemy remained with me for all the London years. Funnily enough, when I became homeless in 1997 for a few months, even though I wasn't eating, I, I still found one way or another to read Enemy. And meanwhile, I've got a few lifelong friendships out of magazines too and one of them was uh, Andy Davis, the then editor of Record Collector magazine. Uh, we met in 1998 and actually Andy was, was the first person who gave me a shot at writing at a magazine. It was such an unbelievable feeling and uh, sort of a victory over London when I walked up to the newsstand when the magazine came out and, and just saw my article. I'll be always grateful to Andy for this because it led to other great things later on. In the early 2000s, I picked up my first camera and moved to Shanghai, but I keep mentioning Hong Kong here because my time was kind of divided between Hong Kong, Shenzhen and Shanghai. We had a business in China and uh, Hong Kong street life really inspired uh, my photography from the, from the very beginning. I did a lot of street photography there, but it was really in Shanghai where everything started and everything fell into place. We moved there in 2006 and I started to document the, the city for myself. And I did this extensively until 2009 when uh, the Dead Shanghai uh, editor JFK Miller spotted me and asked me to, to, to join the magazine. And I became the house photographer for five years. Uh, first I started as a music editor. Uh, I was mostly doing like music photography, like gigs and musicians and stuff like that. Then I took over the food and beverage section and in the end JFK asked me to shoot my first cover story, The Wealth Gap. The first piece that he sent me, at the bottom of the email he had a, um, a link to his website which showed his photography and I had no idea that he was a photographer at this stage. Anyway, I went to the link, I clicked on the link, and I was really quite blown away at how striking his photographs were. They were really imaginative. Um, he'd use his settings well, and I just thought, God, this guy's got some real photography uh, talent. And uh, so I, I, I sort of then employed him as a, a sort of, writer slash photographer and then as our relationship developed uh i took him on as a full-time photographer 
for the magazine and his work just blossomed. With this, I instantly recognized the turning point. I was basically given the chance to shoot my first magazine cover. This is my first cover from 2010 September, and it's really changed everything for me because now I enter the world of magazines, which I've been preparing all my life. And uh, this was just a, an unbelievable feeling when it hit the streets. I was extremely proud because it is a good cover. It is a good first cover too and um, it's, it's very eye-catching and I will talk about this later when I break down all the, the magazine covers. So from then on I was under the authority of two great editors, JFK Miller and Nat Kelly. JFK? Hey, how do you say hello in Hungarian? See ya. See ya. See ya. <laughs> and this is Nat Kelly. What? Hi Ned. Always the last to leave the office here. <laughs> Always. Don't Show this to the time out, Nikki. <laughs> Spy. And then the back page. <laughs> the last page. I'm sending it tonight. Ah, oh, awesome. It does look good. Ah, oh, fucking cool with pictures. Yeah. And this is really when the fun began because Basically, I was doing the same as before. I was documenting the city, but now all the doors were open because I had the magazine behind me. First of all, with JFK Miller, we started to do these exciting photo essays of the streets. We did the kitchens, we did the Shanghai wires, we did the, the Shanghai hairdressers and stuff like this. So we categorized this, the city. We did the most amazing photo shoots of inside people's kitchens and uh, Shanghai's tall buildings and um it, it, but i think the thing that struck me about him is that no matter what the assignment was he knew exactly the right uh photograph to take and i think that's i think he's got three things that make him a great photographer the first is he has got the eye for what makes a great photograph i think you can learn certain skills um you can pick up um knowledge along the way but unless you have the eye uh, I think you'll always fall short as a photographer and Nikki definitely has got that inherent quality of knowing what makes a good photograph and the second thing that makes him a great photographer in my view is he is always willing to put himself in situations where he gives himself that great photograph. So he'll climb out on ledges, he'll, um, you know, get under buses. He, I think in Hong Kong one time he had, you know, traffic stop for him. Uh, he will, he will just, he will put himself in the, in the position to get a great photograph. So I think um, that's the second quality that makes him a great, great, great photojournalist. And I think the third, th third thing that impresses me and any, anyone that has worked with Nicky is his incredible work ethic. He will work his guts out. And then again in 2011 when Ned Kelly took over the editorial position we started this very exciting series of uh, covers. The great thing about working with Nicky, or well, one of the great things about working with Nicky, is that he would literally photograph everything. He was just constantly photographing Shanghai. Uh, so, Whenever you'd need a photo, it turns out most of the time he already had one. Um, and it also threw up these amazing uh, sort of pieces we could do. For example, uh, one, of, one of the great ones is the Yong Kang Lu, which became the big bar street in Shanghai where everybody would go live it up. Uh, but of course, Nicky had a photo from way back when, when there were sort of chickens running around in a wet market uh, street. And then uh, when it first got a few cafes, and then a third one when it was, uh, yeah, when it was a wild weekends were to be had um, 
and so yeah he was just documenting everything and uh, and it, it just paid off and it was just it was just great to see it all he documented the city when going through you know this great exciting period that it was it was a, a joy to a joy to be uh, working alongside him the magazine was like a secret code that cracked the city open for me and I don't think any foreigner shot the city as extensively as I did and I'm really not saying this out of pretentiousness or anything like that. It's just I had so much access and I have so much material on Shanghai. If all these stories haven't proved how much magazines have been leading my life then this one definitely will. It was 2015, I was on an AirAsia flight heading to my holiday destination, Indonesia, Lombok. And when I got on the plane, I picked up the in-flight magazine Travel360 out of the seat pocket and I started to flip through it. And I instantly noticed the, the great quality, how good it was. I mean, this wasn't your usual in-flight rag. Uh, these uh, with a few shitty pages and uh, filled with adverts. This this was like a proper magazine with really good content. Uh, the articles were insightful. The photography was beautiful, and the overall design, just the, the the feel of the magazine was just 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 right. When we landed, instead of putting it back to the seat pocket, I put it in my bag, which you're not supposed to do. And when I got to my hotel, I I just sent randomly like a, a portfolio and an email to uh, to the editor and it's just said you know I'm looking for assignments around Southeast Asia and we could work together and I really wasn't uh, expecting a reply but she did she did reply in, a, in about five hours I, I remember it was within that afternoon or the same day that yes she would like to work with me and how about the first assignment in Shanghai she will send the writer Looking back at these in retrospective for, from five years, I mean, I've been with AirAsia ever since. Now that I'm one of the, the official photographers and, and a photojournalist, it's just unbelievable to look back at this uh, moment, how it changed my life how these little, tiny, insignificant moments can change your life. And because now I'm living in Southeast Asia, and it, this was just a, a, a random thing on my holiday. Even up till now, although very rarely, I have this moment when I look around the office or in the AirAsia headquarters and just think like, what, what the hell happened? I mean, how could this happen that I ended up working with Air Asia. If I said that that Shanghai magazine cracked open Shanghai for me as a city, then Air Asia cracked the whole Asia, the whole Southeast Asia, including the rest of Asia too. I just couldn't express with words how much I enjoyed joining Travel 360 officially, and it was one of the one of the one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. And yet again, through a magazine. Air Asia is, uh, is going in a digital direction now, so the magazine is kind of neglected and, uh, and uh, because of this Covid situation it's, it's, its existence is questionable. It's because everything is going so digital now that I don't think anything magazine related will happen to me in the future. So I think this was the, the last stop. We have to be aware of print and its environmental issues. But still, on a personal level, I don't think digital media will ever be as exciting as, uh, as print media. Not for me, for sure, and not for a lot of people of my generation. Because when you go on a basically ever-changing website, you don't have anything like tangible. It's always, it's always different. It's not, it's, it's not a, it doesn't represent a moment in time because it, it's always changing. But looking back how print media influenced my life and, and uh, it, just, it just brought everything together for me. I, I still don't think that scrolling through hundreds of images polluting your, your vision with, with, with thousands of images through Instagram will ever replace the, 
the feeling of sitting down with the quality magazine and uh, flipping through its pages and its good content. So um, you can call me old fashioned. <laughs>